looks like I have another use for this in the winter. Hey everybody, welcome to Mainly Movies. Today, we're gonna to be continuing my 007 review series with the 15th James Bond film, 1987's The Living Daylights. If you're new here, please consider subscribing for a variety of movie-related content like reviews, rank lists, and trailer reactions. All my reviews include a breakdown of the pros and cons, my rating, and some tailored film recommendations, so be sure to watch through to the end of this video for all of that extra content. The Living Daylights stars Timothy Dalton, Miriam Dabo, and Joe Don Baker, and was directed by John Glenn. Loosely based on Ian Fleming's 1966 short story of the same name, it tells the story of James Bond, played by Timothy Dalton, as he gets enveloped by a Cold War tale of kidnapping and deceit. Who is that? How can you simply change the actor for such an integral and amazing character in such a long-running franchise? No, not Bond. He's already gone through a number of facelifts, so who really cares about him at this point? I'm talking about the wonderful, immutable, true star of the franchise, Moneypenny. Where is she? I don't know who that woman impersonating her is, but that is no Moneypenny. Utter blasphemy. Well, I guess it was inevitable. Lois Maxwell was 60 years old at the time of this film's release, so her tenure as secretary was bound to come to an end sooner or later. Still, I loved her character and wish there had been some more development to her and Bond's relationship, as was really hinted at in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Rather than unceremoniously swapping her out for a younger actress, I actually would have liked to have seen Moneypenny get a promotion and maybe become the new M. M for Moneypenny. Oh well, at least I can enjoy her in the older films. As for the Bond switch, I think that was pretty inevitable too. Roger Moore had been looking a tad too old and worn out in the last few films, making him seem less and less believable in the role. It's funny though, after seven straight Roger Moore movies, I didn't realize how much I had fallen into the Moore Bond groove, so it's legitimately strange again to see anybody else play the character. But The Living Daylights delivers just that, and we get Timothy Dalton in his first of only two Bond movies. And after having watched through all of the Bonds, I still can't say I'm particularly sold on Timothy Dalton's brand of Bond. I guess I should clarify a bit and say that I mean his portrayal of Bond, rather than his Bond movies as a whole, because I actually quite like these two films. But something about Dalton in the role has just never clicked for me. I don't think he's bad, and there really isn't anything specific I dislike about him. He just doesn't really feel like Bond to me. But I think that might be part of his appeal to many people. He ditches much of the humor, loses the pretentious suaveness, and gets down to business. And it's not just the character of Bond that feels different here, it's the whole movie. We've seen course correction films in this franchise before, but The Living Daylights is a clear, concerted attempt to swing the series back to a more serious tone. It has a few moments of goofiness and certainly some levity throughout, but this is, first and foremost, an espionage-driven action film, which actually helped to modernize the franchise a bit. Another thing that helped The Living Daylights was the plot, which was probably the best one in the last decade of the franchise. This movie starts off with an exciting cold opening, which is one of my favorites in the whole series, and then proceeds to weave through a compelling espionage-laced story. Despite being more than a little convoluted and complex at times, it was still really captivating. Like many of its predecessors, this film takes Bond to a number of fantastic locations around the world, though its primary setting is unique for the franchise at this point, the Middle East. With this setting, the film manages to incorporate the then-current events of the Cold War and the Soviet-Afghan War as well. It was only in my last Bond review of A View to a Kill that I noted the lack of on-screen text indicating locations during establishing shots in any Bond film so far. Here we are, only one film later, and bam, Tangier. Go figure. This movie has some of the most memorable Bond gadgets we've had in a while, including the return of the Aston Martin, which we haven't seen since Honor Majesty's Secret Service. There were a few brief moments of shenanigans here. The car chase turned cello case chase was especially enjoyable for me, but the goofiness was definitely dialed back from the more helmed efforts. The action, on the other hand, gets dialed up, and this film's got quite a few intense action sequences. 
This is the most serious toned Bond film in quite a while, and its sense of grounded believability make for an engaging watch. I should also very briefly mention this movie's Bond girl, Cara Malovi. She's not my favorite Bond girl or anything, but given how critical I've been of many of the Bond girls in my recent reviews, I wanted to point out that she's one of the better ones. Her character has an actual impact and role in the story, and while she's never truly independent from Bond, she's pretty capable, especially during some of the bigger action sequences. Alright, let's talk about the pros and cons. The first pro is definitely the action. We've had some good action and fight sequences in Bond movies before this, but The Living Daylights takes it to a whole different level. This movie doesn't just have a handful of good action sequences. It is an action movie, arguably the first Bond movie that could be primarily classified as such. It certainly has its moments of downtime, and there are a few sequences where the action comedy of its predecessor seep in, but for the most part, it's serious action, which helps to tonally set this one apart from many of the other films in the franchise. Pro number two has gotta be the gadgets. There aren't a ton of gadgets in this movie, but the ones that are here definitely get pretty prominently featured. We've got the silly throwaway ghetto blaster boombox that Q introduces, but then we get to see the winterized Aston Martin, which has some of the features we already know and love, plus a few cool extras. And then, of course, we've got the multi-use musical key fob, which is probably the most grounded of the gadgets, as well as the most essential to the plot. The third pro I want to mention is the score. It's been a while since I highlighted a Bond score, but this one really stands out to me. Not only does it effectively incorporate the theme song's melody at points, but it also updates the main Bond theme and makes really great use of that too. This was the last Bond movie that John Barry composed the score for, and I think he really went out on a good one here. On the con side, the biggest issue is how convoluted this plot is. I think the story's good, and that it's a really engaging movie, but the plot, and especially the villain scheme, is inexplicably complex. It's not something that really hinders enjoyment of this movie, but is something that could be a bit confusing if you're not really paying attention. Even after having seen this movie a few times, the exact sequence of which bad guy is doing what and for what reason gets a little jumbled and complicated to explain. My second con is something I hesitate to consider a true con, but I've gotta mention Timothy Dalton here. Like I said before, it's not that I hate him or even really dislike him as the character. He just doesn't feel like Bond to me. He feels like the protagonist of an action movie. And that's not a bad thing, it's just not Bond. He doesn't have the charm, he doesn't play the humor in the typical Bond way. He feels like a capable spy in an action movie, but not 007. I'm gonna give The Living Daylights three and a half out of five paws. This is different. This is a big shift from the Moore era, but I think the return to the franchise's espionage roots and the dialed up action make for a really solid Bond movie. I would recommend The Living Daylights to people who like action spy thrillers. This movie is definitely a turning point in the franchise and makes the distinction between the Moore era and the Dalton era very clear. Apart from a few fleeting moments of goofiness, this is a very serious toned action heavy movie. If you really love the silliness of the Moore films, the transition here might be a bit jarring, but I think it'll still have plenty to it that you'll like. If you liked The Living Daylights, I would recommend the 16th Bond movie, License to Kill. It's the second Dalton-led Bond film and continues with the action-oriented serious tone. It also expands a bit on some of the disobedience we see with Bond in this movie. If you want another serious action-filled Bond film, I'd suggest that you check out the 21st movie in the series, Casino Royale. That serves as Daniel Craig's introduction as Bond and sort of reboots the franchise in a grittier, more serious format. And if you just really like the action here and want to see another big bombastic action movie set amid the Soviet-Afghan war, you might want to check out Rambo 3. It doesn't have any of the espionage or nuance that we see here, but if you just want to see Rambo do his thing, then you might enjoy this one. Alright, a couple questions for you guys. Number one, have you seen The Living Daylights? If so, what'd you think of it? And number two, what's your favorite movie that prominently features a cello? Be sure to leave your answers in the comments below so we can get a discussion going. 
All right, so if you got some enjoyment, insight, or information out of this review, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe or add it to see more videos like this. Till next time, this has been Alyssa with Mainly Movies. The way life should be.